Okay, check, 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 check. Mic check, mic check. Yeah, it's good, good, good. Hey there, everybody at home that nobody knows actually what our stream is. Um, so actually, I got to click the share button here. Okay, I'm copying the share button. And I'm dictating right now to what I'm doing because, you know, nobody knows what's going on. Not even me. Okay. Live stream. Now. Okay. Live stream link. There we go. Hopefully this works. Control V, enter. Bam. Everyone knows what it is, right? Oh, I should say Earth 101 at least. Huh? Uh, Kelly. Earth 101, okay. All right, let's try that. And now one more class, okay. And are you guys ready to go? Got a test? Anyway, whose test is tomorrow? Tomorrow, yay, okay, so you guys, thank you for coming out. Hopefully, if you have any questions, anybody have questions? You got some questions, okay, cool. So we will definitely get to your questions. You have a question? Oh. Huh? I sure do. Okay, give me. Let me get the announcement first, and I'll get you a tissue. Can <laughs> I get a tissue, dude? I got a whole box you can use. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Live stream. Okay, so somebody says, I'm trying to watch the live stream. It's not there yet. There we go. Live stream. Okay. <clears throat> All righty. So we are live streaming. Let's see if it works. Can we just check real quick? You guys mind? Okay. Uh, oops, wrong person. Okay. What am I supposed to do here? I went to the email. Oh, I know why. Study guide. Uh, study guide and uh, final. Uh, it's the preview questions. Who wants to see the preview questions? Anybody? A couple of people? Okay. And there's the study guide. Okay. Okay. Let's check Canvas real quick. Little feedback. Ready for a little feedback? Let's see if it works. All righty, announcements. Click that, announcements. Live stream link. Okay, can you say hello to the people at home? Hello. Ah, it works, awesome. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> All right, here we go. How you guys doing? Woo! Ready to go? This is it. This is it, baby. All right. How many people are graduating? Who's graduating? Yeah. Are you going through graduation? Yeah, I'll be there. I say hi. Wave at me as you go by. All right. Uh, here we go. So let's take a look. We'll do the advanced questions first. Preview questions. All right. So here is the first question. Ooh, okay, wow, that's kind of funky. Here we go. First question, which of the following, which of the four fundamental forces of nature do we believe the dark matter interacts with ordinary matter? Okay, so um, gravity is absolutely a given, right? We know dark matter because of its gravitational effect. We're not sure yet about the other, but... We have ruled out the electromagnetic force, no good. And we've also seen to rule out the strong nuclear force. So the only one left would be D, the gravity and the weak nuclear force. Okay, so that's it. The answer is D. Everybody good? D, D for hello. Okay, here is a tuning fork. You might not know what that is, in which case go look it up on Wikipedia, tuning fork. But this is the Hubble tuning fork. And Hubble thought that what kind of a galaxy was the earliest form of a galaxy? The elliptical galaxies were the very, very beginning galaxies. And then what happens is they would evolve into the other kind that we talked about called 
spiral galaxies. So D is where you would put the baby galaxy, and then it devolves to the first spiral, and then it switches into more advanced spirals or to barred spirals, okay? So letter A is a S0 and a, a spiral, uh, the first kind of a spiral, and then B was going to be a more defined spiral, a grand design spiral over there at B, and C would be a, a well-designed uh, barred spiral, right? A clear barred spiral. But the answer to the question, where would you put an elliptical galaxy, is at D, okay? Letter D. Okay. La, number three, this is one of the ladders rungs, right? It's the most distant rung. It's called the Hubble Law. An astronomer measures galaxies A to have an apparent recessional velocity of 1,000 kilometers per second. So in principle, you could tell me how far away that galaxy is, but we don't do that kind of math, so don't have to worry about it. But galaxy B is twice as far. According to the Hubble Law, what should happen? It's directly proportional to the distance. So if you go twice as far, what should happen to the recessional velocity? It should be twice as much. Forgot to remind me here. Here's your Kleenex. You ready? Woo! Oh, good catch, man. All right. So the right answer was twice as fast, 2,000 kilometers per second. If it was half the distance, anyways, that's the question. That's it. There it is. That's the question. Okay? You don't have to worry about an alternate. That's the one. Okay? I could make another one, but that's the one. There it is right there. There's no, oh, though, there's another question on Hubble's Law, though. So make sure you know Hubble's Law. Ooh, I just gave you away secret information. Okay, number four. Which of the following colors is this emitted most strongly by the sun? The center of Roy G. Biv is what color? Center of Roy G. Biv. G. G is the center. That's the, actually the color. So the sun emits more green light than any other color of light. <coughs> That's a little fact, okay? I think it's kind of cool. When an exoplanet passes in front of its star, right, the light from that star dims for a short while before returning to normal. This method of seeing an exoplanet is called, so by the way, what you're watching is called the light curve. You watch the light curve of the star. And when there's a dip, the planet went in front of it. That technique was called the transit method, the transit method. Okay, transit is what's happening when the planet goes in front of the sun. We call that a transit event, right? So we've seen it happen with our sun and the planets go in front of the sun. Okay, number six, review way back from the first exam. Which of the following situations has the greatest variation in tide? The highest high and the lowest low. So what two bodies are responsible for the tides on Earth? The sun and the moon. Which one's more important, the sun or the moon? The moon is more important. The sun is less important. But they both contribute. And when they're working together, you get the biggest high, high tide and the lowest low, low tide. So that would be either a new moon or a full moon, and we call it a spring tide. So the right answer is D. All the other answers have to do with the other term, neap tide, which is a really low high tide and a high low tide, which means there's almost no change in tide. So that, hey, how you doing? Okay, you want to sign the attendance roster? You get your extra credit? Come get it. David, David, right? David, hey, David. Okay, I can't click my, I don't know what's going on. Oh, I have to click the second page. That is so silly. All right, there we go. I'm not a Mac guy. I'm not a Mac guy. I don't know why I'm not a Mac guy. Maybe one day I won't say that. For all of you at home, I'm going to croon little songs to you as we do our study session here. Here we go. Take a look at the stars, right? We've got a bunch of information, apparent, absolute uh, magnitudes, the distance in parsecs, parallax, uh, angle, and the spectral classification. There's only one question. From the data given, oh, comma, comma, which star in the table has the greatest surface temperature? So... Yes, you need to know that mnemonic. You re there are several questions on the final that will have this, right? O, V, A, fine, girl, guy, whatever, kiss me, right? Whatever you prefer. And so the order is the order. Come get your extra credit if you want that. One extra credit. And I forgot to bring the candy. Sorry about that. Oh, well, no candy today. I have a whole bunch, but whatever. I forgot it. 
And so what are you looking for? O would be the hottest star. There's no O up there. Look at the first letter only. All right? Don't worry about the other letters, just the first letter. So what, what letter comes next after the O? The B. So the B2 Roman numeral 4 would be the hottest star. That would be HR4621. I'm going to get the extra credit, Danny. Okay, everybody good? So O, be a fine girl, kiss me. Guaranteed there will be other questions that use that mnemonic. So make sure you remember it. You still need that. Okay, next question. What was the subject of the great debate in astronomy? Okay, 1920s. 1930 solved by Edwin Hubble, right? What was the big debate? The nature of the spiral nebulae. Were they other galaxies or were they within the Milky Way galaxy? Is it just one big galaxy, which is the entire universe, or are there lots of little versions, right? Are we one little island out in a, in a whole bunch of islands, okay? So the nature of spiral nebulae. It turns out that they were not nebulae. What were they? They were galaxies, right? So from that day on, we stopped calling it the Great Andromeda Spiral Nebula and called it the Great Andromeda Spiral Galaxy. Okay, this is really old too. Exam one. You observe a lunar eclipse. What phase is the moon during a lunar eclipse? It's passing into the shadow of the Earth. It is a full moon. Okay, everybody good? Okay. And this one was on your last exam. So, of course, it's not surprising that you might find it here. The figure below shows two stars that are orbiting each other, a binary star system, and one star is moving towards us and one star is moving away from us. If a star is moving towards us, what kind of a shift would you expect to see? A blue shift, very good, a blue shift. And if it's moving away from us, a red shift. So when you look at this, um, as you can see, one star has a smaller orbit than the other. Why? Why does one have a smaller orbit? It's more massive, right? It's more massive. Remember that the more massive star has a smaller orbit, and the smaller mass star has a bigger orbit. So whichever one is the bigger orbit is the smaller mass star. And so when you look at the shift, what do you find out? The blue shift is going to be a smaller or a bigger one. It's not moving as fast. It's going to be a smaller blue shift, but the red is going to be faster. It's going to be a larger, uh, a larger red shift. So look for the answer. A will have a larger red shift. Here we go. A will have a larger red shift, while B will have a smaller blue shift. That one got it right. Okay? Everybody good? Okay? Yeah. One more time? Uh, number 10. The answer is star A will have a larger red shift, while B will get a smaller blue shift. Okay, redshift if you're moving away from you, the, the light is going, uh, the star is moving away, and blue shift if it's coming towards you. Okay, those are 10 questions. They're on your final. Okay, are we good? Got them? Questions? Okay, moving right along then, we have our study guide. Okay, study guide. Questions, comments, everybody good? Okay, study guide. Let's say it again, study guide. Okay, here we go. Study. God. All right, here we go. Zoom. Okay. Okay, so it's only two chapters, so we're actually not in any problem. We can totally finish everything just fine. Uh, but anyways, if you have any questions at the end, uh, I'd be happy to take your questions. If you're at home watching, I actually do have the capability of looking at your questions. I'm just going to ignore you until the end. But if you have questions, if you type them in, I will go ahead and add them at the end of the review. Okay? All right, so let's start looking at the concepts. And as we do, we'll try to talk about them a little bit. There was a concept of the galactic fountain. And does anybody remember the name of the fellow who came up with it? I guess his name's not up there. Oh, yeah. Bob Benjamin. I just asked you a question, but now I'm telling you. Bob Benjamin, graduate student, came up with a mechanism. He saw the jets of material that were falling back into the Milky Way. But they must have come out of the Milky Way. How did they get ejected from the Milky Way? What mechanism do we think caused the gases to be blown away from the Milky Way? A supernova, right? And then they could fall back in another part of the Milky Way. And what this allowed it to do was mix material from one part of the Milky Way to another. Because a mystery Lyman Spitzer was trying to answer is why 
is the Milky Way so uniform? Why is all the matter pretty much the same? How did that happen? There was a way to get stuff from one side to another, and they call that the galactic fountain. Everybody got that? Galactic fountain. Matter is ejected, but then falls back into the Milky Way. What force brings it back? Force of gravity, of course. The force of gravity brings it back. So supernova ejects it, and then it falls back into the Milky Way under the force of gravity. Milky Way, why do I write that? Okay, Milky Way, it appears as a band of light across the sky, but that's because why? We are in the middle of it, right? We're in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. It's a band because what are we looking at? What's the band? What, are, what part of the Milky Way galaxy are we looking at when we see the band of light across the sky? We're in the disk, right? We're in the disk of the Milky Way. So everywhere we look, we see a lot more stars in the disk and not so many stars above and below the disk in the halo, right? We don't see as much. So that's what you see. When you see the Milky Way across the sky, you're looking at the disk of the Milky Way. The center of the Milky Way is in the constellation, you're supposed to know this, Sagittarius, which is why the supermassive black hole is called Sagittarius A star, right? Because it's actually a supermassive black hole located at the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, sorry about that at home. You can follow along on the study guide, which is posted on Canvas. Okay, Caroline and William Herschel, what's important about them? And Jacobus Captain, what's important about him too? They did star counting. They counted stars and put, made little maps of the Milky Way galaxy. And what did they discover? That it was a big disk, right? Looked at from the side, so it looks elliptical in shape. And where is our solar system? Right in the middle of it. We are in the middle of the galaxy. They were wrong, right? You guys know that they're wrong. But both of them were wrong. Now, how did Jacobus do a better job? Instead of just counting by eye, he used? He took photographs. He took pictures of it and used those to make his maps. But either way... We had a problem. We couldn't see all the stars. What was blocking our view? The dust and other stuff in the way, right? We couldn't see all the stars. So that technique of counting stars failed, right? It gave us the wrong picture of the Milky Way galaxy. It gave us the right shape, a disk, but the size was too small, and it gave the center where the sun is, and we're not the center. And then comes the next concept, a globular cluster. So globular cluster is thousands of stars which were born together and are still together today because what force keeps them together? Force of gravity, right? There's another kind of cluster called an open cluster that you want to remember. And open clusters, they're spreading apart. They're actually not going to stay together. Hey, gravity is not enough. There's not enough stars, not enough mass, okay? Uh, so uh, this... Globular cluster is found in what part of the Milky Way structure? In the halo, yeah, in the halo, right? Not in the disk, in the halo. So they tend to be a little bit further away from us than the stars. <coughs> so Harlow Shapley used the galactic, uh, sorry, the globular clusters, and he found that they, how many are there? Roughly, how many? 150, okay? You should know that it's not a whole bunch. It's 150. So it's a countable number, right? You can actually count the globular clusters. When you look at it, they have a spherical distribution. And the center of that is, he said, not where the sun is located. He got it right. Okay? He didn't get the distance quite right, but he got the right idea. The center of the globular clusters, center of the galaxy. So this is the fellow, Harlow Shapley. He comes up later in the debate. Harlow Shapley was the fellow who, who saw that the distribution of globular clusters was spherical, and he said that the center must be the center of the Milky Way. Okay, so, all right, now we should be able to draw a quick picture. You guys want to just try it? Should we just do it together? So then we can highlight all the things you're supposed to know about the Milky Way. How many stars are in the Milky Way? You memorize this number. About how many? 400 billion. 400 billion, that's a lot of stars. 400 billion stars. There we go. 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. So let's draw a little picture right now. Those of you at home, we're going to, ooh, this is so fun. I've never done this before. Look at this. Oh, man. It's like I care about the people at home too, not just you guys, right? Okay, here we go. We're going to draw a quick, quick sketch of the Milky Way. Actually, I need a little more board. So let me, this is cool. I never tried this. 
Okay, so let's draw a big disc. Okay, so this is the disc. Okay, it's a pretty large structure. How big is it? How wide? How, how wide? What's the diameter of the disc? So two numbers. What are two numbers? Give me one. 100,000. 100,000 light years across, right, from one side to the other. Or 30 kiloparsecs, right? 30,000 parsecs. That's actually an equivalent distance. You're supposed to memorize those, both of them, okay? So that's, that's like a big piece, right? And then we have in the middle, we have this bulge, which, by the way, is part half of it above and half below, right? It's in the middle of the Milky Way. This is the bulge. And how, how big is it? It's about one-third of the size. Yes. Ten. Very good. Okay. So you give me the answer. Awesome. Okay. About 10 kilo parsecs across, about one-third of the size of the Milky Way. So we got the disk. We got the bulge. And the last one. Last one. Last one. Angels. Come on, angels. The halo. Right. Okay. So now I can't draw it very well, but the halo is spherical. And how big? Well, it's like 100,000 light years across as well. So the halo is a spherical shape that goes around the entire Milky Way galaxy. Okay, this is our quick little thing. Okay, what other number? We need to know how thick. When you think about how thick, how thick is the disk at the edge? Who remembers the name, the number? 0.6 kiloparsecs? Kiloparsecs, yeah. 0.6 or about 2,000 light years. 2,000 light years, okay? Pretty good? Roughly, yeah. No, it's like an Oort cloud. Yeah, it's like the Oort cloud for a solar system. It's the Oort cloud kind of like that. Yeah, for the entire galaxy. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Great. Everybody remember Oort cloud, the spherical thing around the Milky Way? That's a great analogy. I love it. Great. Okay, so did we get all the numbers? I think we got it. How many stars? 400 billion stars, okay? 400 billion stars. How many of those stars have planets around them? Every single one, okay? So that's kind of fun. All right. Okay, we're moving back. This is a new thing. I've never done that before. All right, I'm trying new things. I'm experimenting. Let me know at home how that worked. Okay. All right, so moving right along. So we got the galactic disk and got galactic bulge and the stellar halo, okay? Uh, what's a spiral galaxy? Well, Milky Way, how about that, right? It's a, a, a disk shape that's so mostly flat, right? And it has these arms, right? Mostly it has arms. All right, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, well, spiral arms, anybody think of a reason why it's a little tricky to just say, can you always see the whole arm, for example? Sometimes the arm won't be stars all the way from the beginning to the end. You just see part of it, right? It's kind of patchy. And sometimes it's really beautiful and sharp. Um, we could probably, actually, we could do that. We can, should we do that? I don't know. We'll come back. Uh, metallicity. What is metallicity? Metallicity refers to the amount of heavier elements in the stars, right? In the stars. So if you're a first-generation star, what's your metallicity? None. You don't have any. You're made of hydrogen and helium. You're a first-generation star. But every generation that explodes seeds the next generation of stars. And so metallicity goes up. The, longer, the, the more recent your star is, the more metallicity it will have. All right? Everybody good? Remember that? Jason. Hey. So our tutor, if you guys have any questions, Jason is happy to help you. Okay, so here, let's talk about population in one and population two. So you need to know what makes it population one. Where do we find a population one star? Where do you find it? In the, in the disk, the bulge, or the halo? In the disk, okay? What's special about population one? Do they have higher or lower metallicities? Higher metallicities. Are they older or younger? They include younger ones as well, right? They have some old ones, of course, but it's got a lot of younger ones as well. So if they're young, they have higher metallicity because they formed after other stars died, right? That kind of makes sense. So population one, stars in the disk. Older or younger? 
some younger ones. It's got some older ones too, but it's got a bunch of, it has younger ones, okay? Population two, where are they found? In the halo, right? Older or younger? Only the older ones, right? These are older stars. So what tends to happen with metallicity if they're old? Low metallicity, in fact, maybe even none. So some of the globular clusters show evidence that they are first-generation stars of our galaxy, okay? Local group. Oh, wait, sorry, I jumped. Bard spiral. Okay, um, Bard spiral. Hey, Bard spiral is a little bit different than a regular spiral. In what way? It's got an elongated center. So when you draw a picture of a Bard spiral, oh, let's try it again. Should we do it again? Should we move? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's draw another picture. Okay. All right, well, this is not relevant anymore, so I'm just going to erase here. For those of you at home, I hope you're, you know, got a nice little cookie and a soda right here, and you're munching along here. So we've got our spiral, a regular spiral. Arms come out of the center, and a barred spiral is elongated. It has a bar, and then the arms come out of the ends of the bar. Okay, which one is our Milky Way? That, actually, our Milky Way is considered a barred spiral. So one of the things that you want to try to get is that why would this form in the first place? Why would you get something elongated instead of something that's nice and spherically symmetric? Uh, it's been disturbed, right? Something, something, something came along and, you know, stretched it. So what's the force called? The tidal force. The tidal force. So... Something stretched the galaxies. Something stretched our Milky Way galaxy. What could it have been? Right? A big giant. No. What was it? Another galaxy. Okay. Another galaxy must have flown back, some flown by in the past and stretched us a little bit. So in, whenever we see barred galaxy, we know that there was a, some kind of a tidal influence that caused the galaxy to be stretched like that. All right. Local group. What's the local group? Actually, I can do a little bit. Do you guys want to just look at words or you want to look at some pictures real quick? We'll just do a picture. <clears throat> right? We got the internet right here. Let's make it more fun. Okay? So spiral galaxy. Spiral galaxy. Okay. Images. Okay. Beautiful. Spiral galaxies. These are spiral galaxies. They all look different. They're kind of beautiful. Look at this. What's that one? A spiral or a barred spiral? That's a barred spiral. I see the elongated center, okay? So um, when you see that, that's actually a chance for you to, I don't think I'm going to be showing you too many pictures, but, um, but there you go. Yeah, you see the elongation of the center, okay? The arms come out of the edge uh, of the bar, okay? Barred spiral, barred spiral, okay. Uh, and then we just said, let's look at, what was the next thing? What was it? What was it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Local group. Okay. Local group. Local group refers to the galaxies that are nearby. Let's see. This looks pretty cool. Oh, of course, Wikipedia would be good. We love Wikipedia. Okay, cool. All right. So I can't. Okay. So can I just click? I won't let me do that. All right. I, I was trying to get rid of that thing, but oh, there we go. Okay. So you can see, actually I can't see, let's see, take this light down a little bit. Um, you can see that there's spheres here to try to give you a heads up on, on how far away they are. So here's, here's where we are. And then there's galaxies that are a little bit distance. They're, they're showing spheres. You can't see the sphere that they're on, but some of them are above the plane and some of them below the plane. But this handful of galaxies, about 14 galaxies, are close to us in the universe. And because they're so close, the force of gravity is strong, they're never going to leave us, no matter what, right? They're going to stay with us. Yeah. No, no, these are galaxies. So each galaxy has billions of stars in it, right? So this is our local galactic group, okay? So we saw at the very last class, if you saw that video, you can go cruising around through space and there's strands of galaxies that go in every direction, galaxies everywhere you look, right? But these are a handful of galaxies that are not moving away from us. These galaxies are staying with us for the rest of eternity, okay? 
Uh, so one of them is kind of important, the Andromeda galaxy. What is the Andromeda galaxy? The closest spiral galaxy to us, right? The closest one. Not only is it closest, what else? Who knows what else is happening? It's going to come and visit, right? It's going to collide. So the Andromeda galaxy is going to collide. Should we just look at that video quick? Andromeda. Andromeda Milky Way. We've jumped a little bit, uh, but anyways, it's all good, right? Uh, we just need like a 30-second a video. I just need like a 30-second. One minute. Can we watch one minute? <coughs> Anybody want to watch one minute? Is that too much? Oh, yes, yeah, this is good. Okay. So Milky Way, we're all happy, you know, our little bard spiral. Andromeda, another spiral galaxy, a trillion stars coming to meet us, right? What happens when we, when we eventually get close? The gravitational force starts warping both of the galaxies. That process, that collision ends up changing both of them forever. And they're going to merge into one galaxy. You're supposed to know the name because I'm going to ask you this question. What is the name for the new galaxy that forms as a merger of these two? The Milkamata galaxy. It's just a joke. It's the funny little thing. Now you know it, right? So the Milkamata galaxy. What type of galaxy are we predicting it's going to be? An elliptical galaxy, right? So a little preview from the stuff that's going to happen in chapter 16. We predict that this will form an elliptical galaxy. So uh, again, things that we're going to talk about in chapter 16. Edwin Hubble thought that the elliptical galaxies were the first stage, but he got it completely wrong. They're really the end of the spiral galaxy lives. Okay, so, all right, cute, fun, right? Good stuff. Um, okay. All right. So I've definitely been talking about some of these things. Okay, so here we go. Large and small Magellanic clouds. What are those? Those are two irregular galaxies. Um, I, do you need to know that they're regular? Not necessarily. They're dwarf galaxies, though. You need to know that. And they are satellite galaxies. You need to know that. What does that mean? They are orbiting the Milky Way galaxy. They're, they're orbiting us, right? And as they orbit, they're a little bit too close. What's happening? They're in the process of getting eaten, right? They are going to be eaten. They are being eaten right now. The Milky Way is ripping them apart with what force? The tidal force, right? The tidal force is ripping them apart, and we see streams of matter coming in from both of them into the Milky Way. So large and small Magellanic clouds are examples of this kind of cannibalism that we think happens uh, in, in the galaxies. Okay, now jumping to another topic is, again, a little bit... Um, this is a weird jump here, but that's okay. We're going to jump to the spiral arms, okay? And we want to think about direct versus indirect evidence of spiral arms. How do we know that they're there, okay? So the core of the spiral arms is not stars. It's material that will one day form stars. But it's the raw material, not the stars. Where do you find the stars? At the edges of the arms, we have stars, right? So they're called O and B associations. What's O and B tell you? O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. O, B, the most massive, the hottest stars. How long do they live? Because they're so massive. Only a short time, right? So are they older young stars? They're young stars because they only live a little while. So if we see them, they were just born a little while ago, relatively speaking. So what we watch when we see the O and B associations is where these new stars are forming along the edge of a spiral arm. Is it direct or indirect evidence for the spiral arm? It's considered indirect because it shows us the edge of the arm, but not really the arm itself, right? It's where the edge of the arm would be located. So is there any way to see that raw material that will one day form stars? Yes, right? We have, these are, these are the, I, the ISMs, different kinds of ISMs, cold molecular clouds, H1, right? So the two ways that we see them are through radio astronomy. We can see the radio waves, um, not an emanated, but that are coming through them, and we see the absorption spectra. We see absorption of atomic hydrogen, which is a special 21 centimeter line. So you're supposed to recognize that. We first saw that 21 centimeter line, it indicated that we had neutral hydrogen. 
And in order to be neutral, it had to be pretty cool, okay? relatively cool. Okay, so spiral density wave is the idea that the stars don't form all at once, but they, they form in waves that travel down the arm. So each star lives and explodes and makes the next generation. Lives, explodes, and then gradually you see a progression of stars moving down the edge of the spiral arm, but not all at once. It takes time. So they called it a spiral density wave. That's about how much you need to know. The stars form in waves down the arm. Okay. All uh, right. Sagittarius A, star. It's missing a star. Oh, man, I can't believe I left the star off. Okay. Who knows what that is? Sagittarius A star, I mentioned it before. It's supposed to be a little star there. Star. Oh, man, I can't edit a PDF. Okay. It's got a star above it. Um, and that's the supermassive black hole. How big is it? I think I have that listed. It's about 4 million times the mass of our sun. Okay, 4 million solar masses, pretty big. And we saw the evidence, uh, we'll get back to that. Maybe we'll show you that video real quick too. Okay, Vera Rubin, anybody remember her? Vera Rubin, why is she special? She, as a graduate student, measured the rotation curves of galaxies. And other people had mentioned that this was a possibility, but she really showed there must be more matter there than the matter that I can see. Because at the rate that the galaxies are rotating, they should fly apart. They should not stay together. And so Vera Rubin is famous for showing that the predicted um, rotation curves of galaxies did not match the observations. They're going way too fast. And so she postulated there must be dark matter there to keep them from flying apart. This is our first evidence for dark matter with this uh, galactic rotation curve. Okay. So what is the distribution of the dark matter? It's in a spherical halo. It's actually not just in the halo. It's everywhere, but a spherical shape around the Milky Way. Uh, and, and the Milky Way, it turns out, um, it's going to come up in a few minutes. What percentage of the Milky Way galaxy is dark matter and which percentage is light matter? And the answer is 90% dark matter. Okay, so that's a lot. You might not like that. I don't like it either, but it's what it is right now. In order to make it work, we need 90% dark matter. So two of the ideas for dark matter were machos and wimps. Machos really looked like a great idea. In fact, I thought machos was the right answer. And then, unfortunately, we have shown that it doesn't work. But what's macho stand for? Massive, <clears throat> compact, halo, object right? Macho. And what's a good example of a massive object that's very compact? A black hole or a neutron star. Okay, those are great examples. And so we were, the original idea was they're just everywhere. There's black holes and neutron stars all over the place. However, even though we can't see black holes, we can see light being bent by them. And, it, and the predictions would be that if there's that many black holes, that they're going to fly in front of stars and we'll see little flashes of light. And so they're called micro-lensing events. And when we did the calculation, how many we should see, it turned out it would be a lot. When we do the observation, we don't see that. And so that's been eliminated as a possibility. We don't think macho can work because the number of micro-lensing events is too small. So if, if dark matter is machos, then why aren't they producing this effect? And the answer is because they're not there. That can't be it. It's not black hole. Even it would have been great, but it's not right. So the other one is WIMP. What's WIMP? <clears throat> Weakly interacting massive particle. And that's what we think is probably the right answer, right? It interacts through the gravitational force and the weak nuclear force. Do you guys want to review the four forces? Or do you remember those? Everybody remember? Gravity, electromagnetic, strong nuclear force, and weak nuclear force. If you forgot, you can ask at the end, okay? All right, so we think WIMPs is going to be the right answer. What's an example of a WIMP? A neutrino is an example of a WIMP. It's a particle that does not interact with matter very much, right? We have neutrinos coming through our body right now, day or night, right, that are being created by the sun. Neutrinos aren't massive. What's that? Neutrinos aren't massive. It's, it does have a little mass. Yeah, a little bit. They're a little bit. No, they're, they're not very massive, yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, they're not very massive. So yeah, we need a lot more mass. We need a lot more mass, yeah. Neutrinos, they have no charge, right? What was the question? 
Oh, the uh, positron, oh. the electron and the positron. So those are being made in fusion too, right? But those ones have the mass of an electron, and we see them. We, we know about them, yeah. The neutrinos, mostly we can't stop them. They just go right through everything. So they don't interact very much with, um, with matter. So there was a really, this is not relevant. Never mind, I'm not going to tell you. There was something really crazy, though, if you read. They watched a, an element of xenon that is not supposed to decay for the life of the universe. They saw it decay. That's kind of weird. Everybody's like, what's going on? That's pretty weird. Uh, but anyways, it might be related to dark matter. Hello. Ah, yes. Some interesting stories. Okay, well, we'll hear about that. That's not relevant for your class. Okay. But interesting. Anyway. All right. Describe Bob Benjamin's interaction with Lyman Spitzer. Who was Lyman Spitzer? Do you guys remember? It was the referee for the journal article that he was writing. Okay. And they ended up collaborating together. But Lyman Spitzer was looking for the answer to the question, how does the Milky Way mix so effectively? And Bob Benjamin came up with the concept of the galactic fountain. And so that was a really, really cool idea. Okay. How has the Milky Way changed, right, in the last 250 years? From the Herschel siblings uh, to today, right? What has changed dramatically? Has the shape changed? Not disc, disc, disc. Everybody thought it was disc. How about the center? That's definitely changed. When you just use stars, you got the wrong center. The sun was at the center. When we used what? We finally got the right center. The globular clusters, right? Using the globular clusters, we got the correct center. Okay, and anything else? The size has gotten big. What's the correct size now? 100,000 light years across, okay? And uh, blah, blah, blah. Shapley, I think I did that. Population one, population two. Population one, where do you find them? In the disk. What's special about them? Old or young? Young, okay, young. And high or low metallicity? Higher metallicity because they're young, right? And then population two, where do you find them? And the halo, old or young? Old, metallicity, low, right? It's all consistent. Okay, describe the interactions among the, grav the galaxies in the local group. The local group, are they flying away or towards or what? What's going on? They're sticking together, but actually we do know that one of them at least is moving towards us, the Andromeda galaxy. And then the other two uh, that are really close, the Magellanic clouds, large and small, are being eaten by the Milky Way right now. So we're all held together by the force of gravity, okay? We're really close together, and we're never going to leave each other. We're always going to be together, okay? But every other galaxy is moving away from our galaxy, every other one, every other one, okay. <clears throat> Describe how we see the spiral arms. I kind of talked about that already, but let's go through it again. Indirectly, what do you look for? You look for the stars at the edge of the spiral arm. What are they called? They're young, hot stars. They're called O and B associations. How do you directly see the matter in the middle of the style of spiral arm? From radio waves, radio astronomy. The 21 centimeter line is a great example of absorption spectroscopy. Sorry, absorption spectra. Getting too crazy here. Radio waves passing through the hydrogen. Some of the light is absorbed by the hydrogen, and we can see that. Okay. Uh, macho, we just talked about that. Are there machos? Probably not because they didn't do enough of this micro lensing. We didn't get the flashes of light. And why are WIMPs so hard to detect? They don't interact with matter. So if they do, it's very rare. We need to design an experiment that tests over and over millions of times a second, maybe, you know, billions maybe would be even better. And then how will they interact? They will definitely interact through gravity. This question is actually a little misleading. What I want you to say is, it's very likely they interact through the weak nuclear force, okay? I don't know for sure. Denise asked me that question. I don't know that, actually. If they don't interact through the weak nuclear force, then I don't know how we're ever going to understand them, that we're in trouble. If they don't interact through the weak nuclear force, there's no other way to probe them except by gravity, which makes them, yeah, it can't be right. It can't be right. It's gotta be another way, okay? It cannot be that it's only gravity. It cannot be. Uh, it could be, but it cannot be. <laughs> I mean, then we can't ever understand them. All right. Describe how galaxy formation is similar and different than a solar system formation. So anybody think of one similarity? Really beautiful, perfect. 
Which one? Which, which one? Sorry. Oh, they both, yeah. So with disc, disc shape right there. Why do they look like a disc? The principle is called conservation of angular momentum. How many people thought of that, right? Conservation of angular momentum uh, flattens it out as they rotate faster. So that's true, right? But what's the big difference between a galaxy and a solar system? Okay, how about the rotation speeds? As a planet is found further and further from the star, what has to happen to the, the orbital speed? Has to go slower because gravity is getting weaker the further you get from the center. And so they have to slow down. But what about in our galaxy? As you go further away from the center, do the stars seem to slow down? Not very much, right? And so what that means is that the matter is not distributed the same way. So the mass is concentrated in the star at the center of a solar system, but it's not like that for a galaxy. We think that it's much more spread out and much more spherical in nature. That's the dark matter, actually. All right, memorize. Okay, I think I've probably already elited, uh, listed all these numbers, but Milky Way size. Okay, we got that. Halo, I, got, I think I got all these numbers, right? Everybody good? We drew our picture. The position of the sun. Oh, I forgot to mention that. We're on the, the arm called Orion Cygnus, and we're about eight kiloparsecs from the center. Okay. So we're a little more than halfway from the edge, uh, from the center to the edge, just a little more. Halfway is pretty close, actually, to be honest. Uh, the Milky Way is rotating, and the sun takes about 233 million years to make one orbit around the Milky Way. I haven't talked about that, but Sagittarius A star, why am I forgetting the A star? Okay, is uh, about 4 million times the mass of our sun and the percentage of dark matter in the Milky Way, 90% dark matter, 10% light matter. Okay, good, yeah. How does what? The dark matter? Well, it doesn't seem to affect us, right? It doesn't interact, it doesn't, do any, I mean, maybe it's doing something that we just don't know about, but it seems to have such a little impact on matter, normal matter, that it just goes right through us. So it's, it's here, everywhere. It's going right through us like we're not even there, right? It's, it's hard to understand, but, it, you know, imagine, what, what, what if I told you that, you know, walk across this room and you say, no, I can't, I'm going to run into some air molecules. No, you don't care, right? It's just like there's nothing to stop you. You can walk across this room and nothing seems to get in the way. Well, those particles have that impression about everything, all matter. They just walk, they go right through it. You know, it's like not even in the way. And my analogy wasn't very good actually in that respect because you have to move the air out of the way. But <clears throat> the kind of idea, right? It's kind of idea. Uh, we don't know. Yeah, we don't think it does anything really. But maybe at some level, you know, maybe you get little flashes of light sometimes inside of you. You know, when you feel kind of good, all of a sudden you're like, whoa. No, I that's just a joke, right? I don't, I, I, I know, I don't know. All right, I'm randomly picking up something. All right, chapter 16. Okay, chapter 16. This is, seems fast. Are you guys okay? Am I going too fast? Too slow? Want to go faster? Is it okay? <coughs> All right, so spiral nebula, that was the term that we used before we knew they were galaxies. Right, spiral nebula was pre 1920, pre the big debate. Right, we saw these spiral shaped objects, and we had no idea how they would have formed, anyways. But we didn't know what they were. They were thought they were nebula. What's a nebula? The word nebula, glowing gases. Right, they're glowing, they're shining. It wasn't until a little bit later we started to be able to count the stars. Now we can actually count stars in in Andromeda. Okay. Uh, but it took a little bit more work to do that. In the first place, um, they were not able to detect that kind of thing. Uh, grand design spiral. Actually, I should just show you. Uh, you don't have to know too much about it. But what's a grand design spiral? You can clearly see the spiral all the way from the center to the edge. It's a really uh, well-refined looking picture. Okay, stars, 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 everywhere. A flocculent spiral shows little gaps along the arm. It's just words. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Okay, barred spiral, you definitely need to know. We mentioned it before. The center is elongated a little bit. And why is it elongated? 
a tidal force of another galaxy flying past would have, would have caused that to happen. Okay, here's another one. Elliptical galaxy, what does it look like? A shape of an elliptical galaxy. It's uh, egg-shaped, football-shaped. Not quite football pointy, but like egg shape would be good. Uh, okay, a regular galaxy, what's that? Irregular? Anybody want to tell me why it's irregular? It's in the process of collision, right? There's two galaxies colliding, two or more, and what we see is a big mess, right? Because it hasn't settled down to one, one picture, right? But it used to be two spirals or elliptical in a spiral or whatever. Eventually, it'll settle down. Lenticular galaxy, I left it in the study guide. Uh, you don't have to worry about CD, but lenticular is a spiral without arms, right? It's pretty strange. We see um, a spiral type of galaxy. We believe it's a spiral, but there are no arms. Okay, that's a little funny, right? Uh, don't worry about that too much. Actually, I usually, I left it off in the past, but for some reason I left it in today. Anyways, that's the definition, a spiral without arms. Uh, Hubble tuning fork diagram. Actually, maybe we should just bring that up. So you guys can see it for yourself, right? Hubble tuning fork. All right, here we go. Well, this is a schematic. You want to see pictures or schematic? Let's do this first. Okay, can you guys see it? So we start off with the ellipticals, the rounded ellipticals. And let's, this is Hubble, right? He was totally wrong. So you want to understand how he was trying to think of it. He thought that that big spiral was the cloud that had not yet collapsed, right? So he thought that we're looking at the very early forms of a galaxy. And then if they're swirling a little bit when they start, what's going to happen when they collapse? They're going to rotate faster and flatten into a disk shape. So he thought, what did he think? Ellipticals evolved into... Spirals, right? That was what he thought. He was completely wrong. But we have additional data that he didn't have. We know, for example, that in spiral galaxies, do you find young new stars? Are there new stars being born in spiral galaxies? Absolutely. Our galaxy, lots of young new stars are being formed. What about elliptical galaxies? No. Elliptical galaxies don't show new star formation. So that's a problem, right? If you're a young galaxy, but you're not making any stars, does it make sense? Does it make sense? If he knew that one thing, he would have probably not gone this way, but this is what he did. And then he showed that the uh, galaxies evolved to have more defined arms. Actually, this one shows more arms. I'm not sure if that's true, but definitely more defined arms. And then in the other one, it's the center stretched and formed a bar galaxy. And then the arms became more distinctive, right? So sharper, the arms sharpen up. Okay, so that's one picture. And then let's try the one right next to it. This is actually pictures of real galaxies, which is kind of cool. So you guys can kind of see. And then they've got a regular over there. Which one? A regular doesn't quite fit, right? That's not part of the tuning fork. Does everybody understand? Uh, that doesn't quite fit. But uh, anyways, it's a, an artist trying to, or somebody trying to put this together. He's trying to figure out how to classify galaxies. This is a... The first job, it's okay that he got it wrong. We understand he got it wrong. But the big deal was he thought the ellipticals turned into spirals. Okay? In fact, what's more likely? What is the likely scenario? We just saw an example with the Milky Way and Andromeda. Spirals combine to form an elliptical galaxy. They evolve into elliptical, not the other way around. Okay? That's much more reasonable. Oh, that's one. All right. Okay. All right. So, um, megaparsec, pretty simple idea. What's a megaparsec? Big M, little P, little C. Megaparsec means a million parsecs. What's a parsec? 3.26 light years. Okay. So, that's just a number that we use for um, measuring distances in astronomy. But it has a natural thing. If you remember, the parsec is the parallax angle of one second, right? A parallax angle of one second. It's the distance at which a star would have a parallax angle of one arc second. It's 3.26 light years, okay? Uh, so it's a reasonable thing to think about. 
megaparsec comes up in the Hubble's loss. So they need to know that. Okay, so Edwin Hubble, here we go. Our famous fellow, Edwin Hubble, what did he do? He figured out the distance to what? You need to know this. He settled the debate by finding the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. He found that out. And he showed, how did he do that? He measured the period of Cepheid variables. Next word. Oh, it's missing. Never mind. Okay, it's not showing up. Okay, so anyways, uh, it's in the discussion down here. But Cepheid variables is one of the techniques. And Cepheid variables show a really important thing that you're going to have another question on. You had a question before. You should count on another question like this. Cepheid period luminosity relationship, right? So here we go. Let's just okay. So this is a, a a scale that shows you that as you go to higher and longer and longer periods, you get higher and higher luminosity. This is a straight line. Henrietta Swan Levitt, right? She was the one who came up with this, the Cepheid variable. So she showed that there's this relationship. So it doesn't matter how far away the star is, if you see it pulsing in brightness, called a variable star, by measuring the period, you can, you can estimate the luminosity of the star. And if you know the luminosity, what can you figure out? The absolute magnitude. And if you know the absolute magnitude, you can compare it to the apparent magnitude to get the distance, right? That's the standard candle idea. All right. Are we good? Cepheid variable. Cepheid variable changes period is connected to luminosity. Longer period is greater luminosity. So he used that technique with Andromeda, and he found out how far away is the Andromeda galaxy. He said it was a million. Anybody know the actual distance? Actual distance is about two and a half million light years away. All right, two and a half million light years away. So he settled the debate. Once he showed everybody that the distance was two and a half uh, million light years, there was no longer any debate, right? It was gone. Okay, concept called calibration. Each one of the steps on the rung of the cosmological distance ladder requires you to know the step that came before. And when you start using the next rung, you have to connect it to the one that came before. That process is called calibration. The process of calibration allows you to take the next step. So you take a star that you've measured the distance to using one step here, and then you also use this new technique to measure the distance. And you have to make the distance the same, right? So using either technique, I'm supposed to get the same answer. This sets the, the calibration, right? You calibrate the system. And now you can start using this new technique with other stars that you've never measured before. Okay? So what are these, the rungs on the ladder? You're supposed to memorize them in order. So let's do this together, okay? We'll do it together for everybody at home. If you are measuring the closest distance stars, right, the closest one, what technique do you use to measure the distance to the stars? Called parallax, spectral parallax, okay. Then, okay, I should, shouldn't say spectral parallax. Let me say parallax, sorry. Parallax, <clears throat> not spectral. The next one is spectroscopic parallax, which is a little confusing, but there's a question on your final that's going to ask you about it. So let me make sure you know what it means. The word parallax is actually not relevant because it's not really a parallax measurement. They threw it in there because it's measuring a distance, and that's what parallax is used for. But it's called spectroscopic parallax. What do you do? In spectroscopic parallax, you compare two stars, and if they have the identical spectra, then that means they are the same temperature, exact same temperature. And if they're the exact same temperature, and they're on the main sequence, then they must have the same mass, which means they're basically the same star. Okay, They're like twin stars that are not near each other at all. But because they're twin stars, if we know the, the mass, we also know the luminosity of that star. Okay, so by matching the spectra, you identify the magnitude of that star, the absolute magnitude of that star. And now when you look at it, you can measure the apparent magnitude. You can get the distance. 
Okay? So second step, spectroscopic parallax. Third step, third step, Cepheid variable. Okay? Oh, they're in order right here. <laughs> Just read the order. Okay. We're trying to not look at this. Third step, Cepheid variable. Fourth step, Tully Fisher rotation of galaxies. Not a very good one. It's there. Fifth step, type 1A supernova. Sixth step, the Hubble law. Right? Hubble's law. Okay, so just going through them again. So spectroscopic parallax, I, I talked about this. Cepheid variables, I also talked about, right? They pulsate with brightness, right? They get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. And if you measure the period, you can determine the luminosity and from that, the absolute magnitude. Hey, Tully Fisher says that if you measure how fast the outermost stars of a galaxy are rotating, the rotation of that galaxy, you can estimate the mass of the galaxy. And if you can estimate the mass of the galaxy, then you can estimate the luminosity of the galaxy. But it's really very um, fuzzy, right? 50% uh, error is common. So it's not a very precise method, but it works. It's just not very good. Okay, type 1A supernova, awesome, fantastic, really wonderful choice, right? What, what is a type 1A supernova? You guys are supposed to know that. What happened? Little white dwarf, right? What happened? White dwarf had a companion, red giant companion maybe, right? Grabs matter, everything's fine. Little flashes every time it grabs matter. And then one day, it exceeded the Chandra Sekhar limit, right? If the white dwarf goes above this number, 1.4 solar masses, the electrons can't hold it up anymore. <laughs> Collapses. And all of that energy, all of that material fuses very, very quickly. And so you get this enormous explosion, but it's well, well characterized. So it's when a white dwarf exceeds the Chandra Sekhar limit, 1.4 solar masses, and it explodes all at once. So do we know the mass of a type 1A supernova? Absolutely. 1.4 solar masses. That's the day it goes over, right? Uh, and it's not by much. It doesn't have to be much at all. So it's about 1.4 solar mass. Okay. And then the last one, Hubble's law, says that galaxies are moving away from us, not the local group, everybody else. And the further you go, the greater this velocity will be moving away from us. It's directly proportional to the distance. So if you go twice as far away, the galaxies are receding twice as fast. If you go 10 times as far, the galaxies are receding 10 times as fast. Okay. Uh, all right. So the current Hubble constant. Okay. So the law, the law says, actually, maybe we should just take a second and write the law down. Should we try it? Or we, I don't know. You guys want to write it down? Raise your hand. I want to write it down. Anybody? Well, okay. We got a couple of people. So we write it down. The law is very simple. It says, that the speed of a galaxy receding, you want to write it on the board? Let him do something. He came all this way for you guys. Let's take a look over here. All right. Okay, the recessional velocity. Jason is writing down recessional velocity equals a big H, a constant, times distance, D. Okay? And um, he's going to tell you that the distance has to be measured in Mega parsecs. So put a bracket D, bracket. Yeah, do the bracket. Bracket D equals MPC. Okay. You have to measure the distance in mega parsecs. We're not going to do the calculations, but just so whatever. So then, big H, write it in big, big and bold, big H, the current value of the Hubble constant is 68. Got to memorize that number, 68. Just because I'm going to ask you a question. What is the current value? I didn't put that as an assault. I didn't tell you this, but you have that as a question. What is the current value of the Hubble constant? Okay. 68. Oh, no, that's not the units, man. We got to fix that. Erase those units for me. Okay. Kilometers per second. It's got three parts, remember? Kilometers per second per big slash megaparsec. Okay. So 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That's the number that you have to memorize for the Hubble constant. Okay. Um, what was that? Was that somebody's phone or was that me? Was that somebody's phone? Oh, was your phone over here somewhere? Okay, it's yours? Okay. 
Is that you? That was you? No, that's okay. No, I'm not mad, or I just want to make sure it wasn't me. At home, can you guys still hear me? Oh, there's people here. Hey, hi there. How you doing? <laughs> okay. Hi. All right, we're almost done. Keep going. Okay, so the Hubble constant. Okay, jumping to a new category of stuff. This is really cool. This is actually, uh, we had enough time to go over this, but you guys want to know that the concept of the AGN is a kind of a cool thing. It solves a bunch of problems. AGN stands for active galactic nuclei. The cores of galaxies are active all the time. Nope, not all the time. About 10% of the galaxies are active. But it turns out that we see active galaxies, and we now have a unified model of the AGN, active galactic nuclei. And so you kind of want to know that. Before we had the unified model, before we had that model, we didn't know that all of these different things were actually probably just the same kind of object. Okay? So what are the different kinds of things? Safer galaxies is one of the things we saw. Those are radio galaxies, but it turns out that we also see something else. So there's type 1 and type 2, and we went over those in class, so you're supposed to know that if you look at a type 1, you see a lot more ultraviolet and X-ray. And we'll explain why in a few minutes. We see ultraviolet and X-ray along with the radio. Okay, Type 2, we see infrared, a lot of infrared coming out of it. Okay, So type 1, ultraviolet X-ray, type 2, infrared. Quasars are quasi-stellar radio source. Quasi-stellar. They look like stars, but they're way too powerful to be stars. We actually had no way to explain them. There's no physical model to create as much energy that seems to come out of quasars. But we now understand we were wrong about what was happening. We didn't know we were looking at like a laser beam. We thought it was shooting in every direction rather than just a jet of energy. Now that we know it's just a jet of energy, we can actually explain the amount of energy that we see. But quasars are some of the brightest and most distant things. Again, we're changing that, though. The distance is re recalibrated when you realize it's not as bright as you thought. Uh, anyways, okay, it's changing. Uh, quasar, then, is quasi-stellar radio source. Okay, superluminal. Supposed to know that word. It just means... Faster than the speed of light. Now, can anything go faster than the speed of light? No, not supposed to. Not allowed, right? Uh, in, in special relativity, we learn speed of light is the maximum speed. There are a few little exceptions. We shouldn't talk about that in here. But if you like that kind of stuff, take the black holes class. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, superluminal is probably wrong, right? We, we measure the speed as being faster than the speed of light. Something's wrong. But it must be so close to the speed of light that we can make that kind of mistake. So these are jets that are coming out of this active galactic nuclei almost at the speed of light. Okay, that's pretty phenomenal. The amount of energy is amazing. So we're going to come up, we're going to draw a picture in just a minute of the unified model of the AGN. And the AGN outflows, not too much. But anyways, I, I really, the jets are going to be the big thing that I talk about with that. Okay, so outflow is another name for jet. Okay. Jet, jet outflow. It's not strictly true, but you know, for our class, that's what it is. Okay, outflow, jet. How many jets? Two jets, right? There's always two because what are the jets associated with? Who knows what the jets immediately tell you? Magnetic field. There's always a North Pole and a South Pole. The jets are coming from the magnetic field. You have to have that, right? So that symmetry actually gives us a clue that this is a phenomena related to the magnetic field being created in these extreme environments. How does it work exactly? I'm not sure, but you know, people are trying to come up with models. It's really crazy. How do you get something moving at the speed of light? Okay, so we'll talk a little bit. About, let's go ahead and just jump. Let's try to make our unified model of an AGN. Okay, so our unified model of an AGN. Actually, I don't have to draw it, but you want me to draw it or? Get a picture on the internet. What do you guys want? Draw a picture or get a picture on the internet? Draw a picture. Raise your hand. Get a picture off the internet. Okay. All right. So we're going to get a pretty picture. I could draw one afterwards if you want. <coughs> okay. Here we go. 
we got our unified unified AGN model. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's actually pretty cool. You like that? I like that. Let's go to pictures though. Let's see. Ooh, okay. Uh, you want a diagram or something cool? All right, let's see. Ooh, that's pretty cool. Oh, I like that. I think I kind of like that. I think I kind of like that. You guys like that? That's pretty cool, actually. I mean, it's kind of dark, but that's actually a good thing to see. So what you have is in the center of an AGN, what do you have? Something important, the power, the source of the energy that's going to really come out of this thing. A super massive black hole, right? At the core of every galaxy, we have one already. So now our AGN is going to produce the phenomena that we are that we're seeing with these different kinds of galaxies. So start super massive black hole. Now, are all galaxies active? No, definitely not. So what makes some galaxies active when other galaxies are not active? What's the difference? And the answer is the accretion disk. Is there an accretion disk or not? So is our supermassive black hole right now, can we see it? Not at this moment because it's not eating anything, right? When black holes eat, the process of eating forms an accretion disk around them. And that accretion disk is really, really hot, right? So a hot accretion disk is one of the features of an active galactic nucleus. So supermassive black hole, accretion disk, it won't always be there, but when it's there, we have the possibility to have an active galactic nuclei. Okay, so the accretion disk, what's the accretion disk gonna do for you? Well, as the matter is, is swirling around the black hole, it's circulating charged matter. What is it gonna do? It's gonna create the magnetic field. Where does the magnetic field come from? From the accretion disk, mostly, right? The charged matter, which is circulating around the black hole creates the, the magnetic field, the powerful magnetic field. Okay, now outside that, take a look at this big donut. It's almost like a tire wrapped around the disc. If you see, we cut away the tire so you can see inside, but normally it goes all the way around. We call it a torus of dust, right? It's supposed to be dark because it blocks the light. What kind of light can still get through that dust? Infrared, infrared, not ultraviolet, right? Ultraviolet is going to get blocked, but infrared can make it through. Remember, we can see with the infrared through the dust cloud. So here's the idea. If you look at this disk from this direction and you're not obscured by the dust, then you're going to see the really hot accretion disk. And you know what it's going to irradiate? X-rays and ultraviolets. So that's a type one safer galaxy. That's what it is. We're getting the view down the hole here, right? We can see all the way down the hole to the disk. And by the way, there's jets coming out here. We're not looking at the jet right now. We're just looking along, not along the direction of the jet, but into the accretion disk. Now, if you look from the side like this, anywhere here, and the dust is getting in the way, what do you see? You see the infrared light. That's a type two safer galaxy, right? And then, was that, sorry? One more time. Black the black hole, you can't see it either, right? Oh, like what, like the, ejecta the, the ejecta? No, say one more time. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's the black hole picture. Oh, the one that just came out. Yeah, that was an accretion disk. Oh. The, the black hole picture that just came out recently, they're showing you the accretion disk around the black hole. Yeah. So yeah, that would be like being able to look. Actually, it's even better than that. We didn't get our view blocked at all by the infrared, by the uh, by the dust at all. Yeah. So you were looking like a, a safer type one, but it's really close. So we're not actually. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Is it an active galaxy? It must be somewhat active, right? It's got the accretion disk around it. Thank you. That's a great connection. Okay, so we got a safer type two, and then if you look along the direction of a jet, you see a quasar. Okay, or a blazar is the other term that they use. I still forgot to go look that up. I'm going to say they're the same thing. If I'm wrong, I should look it up right now, huh? Oh, uh, now I'm going to be in trouble. Blazar. 
versus Quasar. Uh, well, okay, that didn't help me. Okay, so what's the quasar? Oh, okay. So the same thing. <coughs> okay, let's not get into it. It's not that bad. Yeah, let's say they're the same thing. Okay, close enough. Close enough. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Okay. So wait a sec. I was looking at a picture. Did we finish the picture? I think we did, right? We got the three different things. Say for type one, say for type two. Uh, what's the next one? Say for type one, say for type two. Quasar. Is that it? Say for type one, say for two. Blazer, blazer. Oh, that's it. That's it. It's not that much, huh? Okay. So the it, unified model works. Okay. That's it. Okay. Cool. That's it. All right. Great. That's all I can think of. Here we go. Then. All right. Okay. So be able to describe the nature of the big great debate. We've already talked about it. But what? Who are the two people? Right. The two people were Harlow Shapley. What was Harlow's belief? What did he believe? You're supposed to know this. Okay, so I'm asking you something that is on your exam. Harlow Shapley, he was famous for finding the globular clusters, which located the center of the Milky Way. And he said, what? Is this everything or is this one of many? Which one did he say? This is everything. Everything that we see, that's the Milky Way. Everything is inside the Milky Way. That's it. That's the galaxy. And that is the universe, the entire universe. Heber... Heber, I'm, Heber Curtis, that's Heber, that's correct, not Huber, Heber. He thought that this was one galaxy amongst many, right? And that each one of the spiral nebulae is another galaxy with billions of stars in it. Was he right? Yes, he was definitely right, okay? And who was the person who established that that was the right picture? Edwin Hubble, okay? What did he do? He studied the Andromeda galaxy, Located certain stars, what were they called? The Cepheid variable stars, and identified the distance to be a million light years, so much bigger than any other star distance that had to be outside of our Milky Way. Okay, major differences between spiral and elliptical galaxies. Okay, so we mentioned a couple of things. Number one, what is the color of an elliptical galaxy? Do you guys remember that? Are they red or blue? Which one was it? They're red, right? They're made of old stars. Now, another cool thing, um, so then spiral galaxies are blue, right? They have young stars in there. So as an overall idea, if you find young stars, then it gives it a blue characteristic, right? Blue indicates what? Young, hot stars, right? That's how you get blue stars. Uh, something else we see. What about the number of globular clusters found in a spiral versus an elliptical? Which one has more? Elliptical galaxies have more. Doesn't it make sense, right? What's going to happen when Milky Way and Andromeda join? They're going to make an elliptical galaxy. How many globular clusters will there be? Whatever's in the Milky Way plus whatever's in the Andromeda. Okay, uh, you guys saw a video clip. I'm going to assume that you remember this. How many stars do we expect to collide with other stars when the galaxies collide? None, right? None. I know it's kind of hard to imagine, but these things are just going to pass through each other, right? They're going to be gravitationally connected, but there really won't be stars running into other stars. It's not going to happen. It's such an extremely rare thing. It really is not going to be the story. So all those globular clusters will be swirling around in all different directions in the elliptical galaxy, but the difference is in a spiral galaxy, they have a very consistent angular momentum. In the elliptical galaxy, the angular momentum is in all different directions. It's not consistent, which is, again, 
a great story to tell when it's made of more than one spiral galaxy. Yeah. The Oort cloud? So the Oort cloud in the shape is kind of like the, um, uh, the halo of a spiral galaxy. But the Oort cloud is just a bunch of stuff outside of our, mil outside of our solar system, right? So it's not as not so big. It's a you know hundred. It's how big? Uh, sixty thousand light years. A light year. Like, sorry, sixty thousand AU. One light year away. But we're talking about the Milky Way, which is a hundred thousand light years across. So there are really big differences in the scale, right? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. How is that? Oh, how many stars are forming inside of the the elliptical galaxies then? Nothing. Nothing. Right? All old stars. Okay, explain how Hubble originally interpreted the tuning fork. The oldest galaxy was the what? What did you start with? Sorry, the, the youngest. The youngest galaxy. Say it again. The youngest version of a galaxy was called an elliptical galaxy. And he thought that it just hadn't collapsed yet. And so he thought that was a young version. And then gradually it would flatten out into a spiral pancake, right? But he was wrong. The opposite, right? What happens is that the spirals collide and form the elliptical galaxies. Okay, the major components of the AGN. What are the major components? Supermassive black hole, accretion disk, torus of dust, and jets, right, that come out of it. Those are the major components, the major features. Okay, one third, oh, one third of the spirals are barred. How about that? And the rungs, we did that. The current value of the Hubble constant is now 68, okay? It used to be 69, it was 70, I don't know, it's changing. And I'm not going to mention it, but in fact, there's a big problem in astrophysics right now because this is probably not right, okay? It's probably not the right idea, okay? The theory is probably wrong. But anyways, don't worry about that. For our class, you know, don't worry about that. Okay, so I'm done with the review. If you have questions, you should uh, stick around. We'll stick around. We have another half an hour. If you have questions or you want to talk about anything, I'll be here. Good luck on your finals. See you guys soon. Thank you for coming. Thank you at home. Any questions at home? You can say something. Hey. I know you're super busy. I emailed you last night about the And I didn't. I didn't. Okay, I got you. I'm going to fix that. I'm going to fix it. I actually have it on my list. And I thought I did it, but I didn't do it. I'm sorry. Did you send me an email or did you do it through yeah. Canvas? Yeah, I did it through Canvas. Okay, so that's what happened. It's in another place. I'll find it. I got it. You got it. I'll fix it. Anybody have questions? If you didn't get your extra credit, come and get your extra credit. Yeah, Danny. So the one day that I missed the class when you discussed the breakdown of like what the test is going to be. Sure, let's go over the test right here. So this is actually at the beginning. Is the final going to be in this room? The final is in this room. What What is your class? Eight or nine thirty-five? Uh, Tuesday. It's at eight. You're at eight, so you yeah. come on Thursday at eight a.m. in this room. Okay. Yeah. Sure you got it. Okay. <laughs> sure thing. So you know how we get one favor, right? Which one? Yeah, yeah. You just send me an email. Okay. I'm asking. Did you send me? I have to email yet. Okay, send me an email so I can do something. Gotcha. What are you asking for? A big, big favor? Um, what can you do regarding homework? Like, our homework? Is, like yeah, just send me an email. Okay. Ask for what you want. If you don't ask, you won't get anything. Got it. Okay. But if you ask, maybe I can give it to you. Right, if I can't, I'll tell you I can. For sure, yeah. Just ask, okay? For sure, got it. I'm asking. I just want to on here. What's the highlight? It means that you got points for attending. This is the tutor logs. Okay. I didn't have a chance to oh, make no new ones. Yeah, so you're going to, you signed again? Uh -huh. Good. Oh, yeah. okay. okay, so here's what it is there's yes. 100 multiple choice questions. Right. Oh, it says right there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 40 questions from 15 and 16, okay. and 60 from the first three exams. Okay. So review your exams because 20 come from exam one, okay. 20 from exam two, and 20 from exam three. Okay. okay. I know it's like you. I okay, I didn't open it. Uh, oh, what, what, what did you, sorry, what? what yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I it's not working? Oh, I didn't get a response, so. Oh, you didn't get a response? Yeah. Oh, man, okay. Um, okay, so when did you email me? Uh, maybe like a week ago, and oh. last night. Or, and last night? Yeah. Oh, man, no, I'm really, that's bad. Okay, hold on. Let's take a look real quick. Okay, what's you your last name? Reopen it. Bye, oh, Howard. What was that? Yeah, bye, oh, Howard, the beach. Oh. Oh, yeah, T. 
Okay. I don't know. Are you sure you sent it to me? Uh, I hope so. Here. How do you spell V A A L E J L E when? E J L. E J L. Oh, maybe I sent it to the wrong one. I can help you do it. Check it out. So yeah, T L A L. This is your first name. Yeah. No, man. I, oh, here, here. No, no you sent me an email back in the beginning. You're sending to the wrong Sean Ooh. Kelly. I know. I'm sorry. No, that's my fault. It's my no, fault. no, no. But that's it. Sucks. I sucks. Yeah, you go. It's S P. Yeah. What did you see? What it is? Uh, if you don't see my picture, that's, that's not me, Mo. No, that's the other one. You're bugging the wrong guy. You have been. Okay, so send me an email, okay? okay? Thank you. S.P. Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, and by the way, it has my picture. It's going to have a little picture right there. Okay, all right, sorry. Okay, we can fix that, though. Hey. We have a question. We yes. Both have so, the, same, yeah, the same problem. problem. Uh -huh. The same problem. We um, so both got a zero on the first Gateway Tutor visit. And you went to the break and Gateway went, Tutor? Who did you I see? Do you remember? You got a zero yeah. too? Okay. It was so long ago, I don't even remember. You remember, but you, you really she promised was, you went? Okay. Was like, because I, I went through the logs hard. and I tried to give you, but I, you know, it's possible that something happened. I don't know. Maybe I didn't get the log or something. I went like, I think like the first day. Okay. So why don't you do this? Could you send me an email saying that you spoke with me? Okay. Oh, uh, now everybody hears this. Okay. But this is the right thing to do. I think I remember if you went, his name too. It doesn't matter schedule. actually. Just tell me. I'll believe you. Okay. 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 Can you do that too, Melissa? Yeah. I went can okay. I message you on Canvas? Do you want me to email you through? Either one is fine. Uh, I'll change it. Okay. Well, let's see. No questions at home. Any any people at home? You have questions? We're still live streaming. We're live streaming. Hey, how you doing? Yo, it's like this and like that. Come on. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. I know, right? I have another question. Okay, okay, another question. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. Gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and end the live stream if you're not asking any questions. So um, that's it. We're done. Good luck. Hour and a half. Thank Woo. You. You're welcome. Did I, you can ask a question. I didn't, did you get it? Just send me an email then, okay? Okay. <clears throat> All right, Melissa. Um, you know, you know the, first, the, the, the diagram that you brought up with the, the HR. Sagittarius A was. Uh, oh, it was for the. The preview questions? No. no. <laughs> Wait. At the beginning, when you first, not the preview questions, but the first start of the beginning of the, mm -hmm. it was for, um, you know, that grid that you pulled up for the O, not OB, yeah. but um, where you got the 68 number? Oh, 68, Hubble, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, like, pulled it up, like, at the beginning of your preview. Oh, it was one of the preview questions. No? Maybe, I think. Maybe. It could have been. It might have been. It might have been, actually. Let's let's just look again. It was like the, the graph that has... Um, we had it on the last exam. Yeah, this thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, mean, how does that work? Okay. Yeah. How, so how did look you at, get this? this okay, so let's take a look real here. So use the chart below. Hint. The first letter of the spectral class is most important. So what is the what are the letters? O... See the O B A. Say the rest of it. O B A. That's all I know. That's all you know. O B A. Fine girl or guy. Oh. Okay. Kiss me. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So o B A. Fine girl, kiss me. Okay. You got to know the whole thing. O B A. Fine guy. You so want to say F? what do you like kissing, guys or girls? Okay. Uh, Whatever you like. Okay. O B A. Fine yeah. G. Oh, like that? No, sorry. So, no, it's O. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm trying, I'm trying to do the mnemonic, but it goes like this. I'd o. Just do, I just do the letters. That's B. Fine. That just confuses A. Me. Fine girl, kiss me. That's the letters. Yeah, I, I kind of heard this like that. It just confuses me when you put all the other. Okay, okay. Okay. O, B, so, a. which one is the hottest? The O. The O is the hottest. Which is the coolest? Uh, the M. M is the coolest, okay? And these are in the correct order. So hottest, the coolest. Okay. So what's the second hottest? It would be the B. And the third hottest? The A. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now, when I ask you the question, which one <laughs> has the greatest surface temperature? The answer would have been O. But there's no letter O. 
doesn't start the starting letter is the letter. <coughs> Do you see any O's? No. What's the next hottest letter? So when you see there's a one B, that is the next hottest star. <coughs> so the answer is the star, HR 4621. Oh, okay. So you, you look at the spectral classification. You can't look at anything else. That's what you have to look at. Because this is the order of the, if I had said, what's the coolest star, then what would that, well, that, that'd be, oh no, that's easy. What's the coolest star? 58 ori. Yeah, because of the M, the M is the coolest star. Got it. Okay. Now I can. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes okay, sense. Okay, so just the first letter. Okay. Cool. <laughs> good. All right. Good, good. All right. See you tomorrow. Did you sign in? You got the extra credit? Yes. Okay, cool. Thanks, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, 